I'm Dominic Nichols and this is Ukraine The Latest. Today we discuss the concept of a Russian Union state and we're joined by former MP Aliona Halivko to consider the 2014 Revolution of Dignity and talk about the origin of the Zelensky cocktail. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 28th of December, day 308. I started with a roundup of some of the news around Ukraine. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. The air raid alarms have been going off all morning across Ukraine and out of the southern city of Herzon, which obviously was evacuated by Russia about a month ago. The leader of the Herzon region has said that there were 50 strikes across the region yesterday, including 23 in the city. That includes areas that have been hit, been a medical centre, kindergarten, bakery, private apartments, you know, all clearly military facilities, as, you, as you'd expect. There's uh, There's been, a, a well, not an exodus, but there's a, a large number of, of people leaving. Over 400 have left since Christmas Day. That was from a, a colleague of mine at the, at the BBC. But there does seem to be down south. All Russia's able to do, and clearly willing to do, is just keep firing across the Dnipro River. That's all, that's all they're yeah, it, just suffers. It, it, it confers no military advantage whatsoever, but that's all, they, all they're willing to do. Elsewhere, the Ingalls Air Base, the air base about 600 k's inside or from the Ukrainian border, um, southeast of, of Moscow, but deep, deep, deep inside Russia that was hit, firstly hit on December the 5th, hit on December the 5th, and then it was hit a couple of days ago, we think by a Tupolev 141 old reconnaissance drone, an old 1970s technology drone that yet again got through Russian airspace and uh, and hit the, well, it either hit the base, or Russia claimed it was shot down, but whatever happened, three people, this is according to Russian sources, three people were killed on the ground there. Um, I mean, the, the footage on social media suggests that it was a, it was a very a very big bang, so that either the thing was shot down and still functioned, or, or you know, Russia's not telling the truth, but there was a very big bang at the Engels Air Base. Now, since then, Reports are suggesting that that this base that has old Tu-95, Tupolev 95 propeller-driven long-range strategic bombers, the Bear bombers, and the Tu-160 jet-propelled or jet-powered um, bombers that can fire nuclear missiles, can air-launch nuclear missiles. These are the bombers that have been conducting a lot of the long-range cruise missile strikes inside Ukraine. The aircraft themselves not going into Ukraine, not leaving. We don't think leaving Russian or Belarusian airspace, but they're firing these firing the missiles from there. And we think from about twenty ish that's housed on the on the the base, eight eight or ten, so roughly half, we think have been moved uh, somewhere into the far east of Russia. Although, as I said, there was an attack the other day. The mission control center was destroyed, so it's unlikely that anything will move out of there, will be able to attack out of there in the in a short period of time. There are other long-range air bases, strategic air bases, so maybe Russia's going to disperse the fleet. But for now, it looks as if that has stymied that, that vector a little bit. Now, the Ukrainian military still have not admitted at, um, either of these attacks, but an Air Force spokesperson did say the explosion at Engels the other day was the result of what Russia's doing on Ukrainian soil, which kind of suggests... Uh, that's uh, that's the way that's the way they see it going um, with help putting their name to it. Next thing to note, Sergei Lavrov, oh, Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister. He was interviewed yesterday on TASS, so Russia's uh, state uh, state media, and he said that the Kremlin will continue to pursue military solution to the war until the Ukrainian government gives in to Russia's demands. So absolutely no change in their position at all. I mean, really. You know, nice one, Sergey. You're responding to events there. You've you've, you've changed your demands and your tactics uh, in light of uh, what's happening on the ground. He said that, that that Ukraine and the West quote are well aware of Russia's proposals on the demilitarization and denazification. I mean, you know, it's just the same old tired ideas. It's it's clearly not working. So let's just keep doing the same thing. That's going to work. He said that the, the Ukraine and the US must recognize the, the Luhansk, Donetsk, Saporizhia and Hezon Oblast that, that you had those sham referenda 
couple of months ago. And, and all that has happened in each of those areas since those referenda happened, took place was that Russia has been pushed back in some areas more than others, but they've only gone backwards in all four of those of those areas. So still banging this drum saying that, oh, these were our, these were our territory and oh, it's just boring, but they've got nothing else. The reason I highlight this, well, firstly, because he said that the, the, the two, as in Ukraine and the US, although it doesn't, doesn't name Ukraine, you won't give it, won't respect the country by even saying the name, but he says the U- U- Ukraine, in other words, and the US are responsible for prolonging the war and that the US could, quote, put an end to, to the senseless resistance. So still trying to frame it as this is Russia against the US, because clearly Russia couldn't be pushed back and be losing militarily to, to little old Ukraine. It's got to be the big boogeyman. It's got to be the US. It's NATO. It's the West. It's, it's everyone else. They're still trying to frame this in, in the kind of great power terms, denying Ukraine any agency whatsoever. And, and I just I highlight it not because I like echoing Sergei Lavrov's words, but it's just th- this is the same. We've heard it month after month, year after year in different guises they are out of ideas they do not know what's happened to them this lightning three-day advance that's now into its 10th month i mean they they just do not know they can't comprehend what's happened to them and they're just coming out they think if they keep saying the same thing over and over again as much as they as they've convinced themselves they will they will convince others it's just it's extraordinary to see and and i i highlight it just to show how how, how delusional it really is. Just finally, a couple of things. French Defence Minister Sebastian Lecorne, who's in Kiev today, he travelled via Poland, cut the satellite deal with Poland. He's now in he's now in Ukraine, uh, in Kiev. Possibly, who knows? Maybe talking about more more weapons, perhaps more Caesar self propelled howitzers. The very 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 good long range, pretty accurate one five five mil howitzers. France has currently promised twenty four. We think twelve have been have been delivered, but they are. To all intents and purposes, we hear very good reports of the French uh, Caesar self-propelled houses. So hopefully, more on the way there. And just finally, one one little bit of news that, I, that I'd be really interested in Aliona's uh, view on this. So the Secretary of Armenia's Security Council, Armin Gregorian, he he said in an interview on Monday that Armenia is facing pressure, his words, pressure to join uh, Russia and Belarus in a union state, capital U, capital S, union union state. Now this has been an idea that that's been around for a while. Mr. Gregorian saying that that the Armenia's refusal and and the efforts to, as he says, re- remain a sovereign state means Armenia now faces military confrontation. Uh, Nothing. This is really interesting because we've talked we've talked in the past on the podcast about how how Russia has very few allies and the the CSCO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, that Russia would love to to style as sort of equivalent to NATO. It's not equivalent to NATO at all. Either in the in the in the size, the capability, or the or the political unity, but this is uh, a lot of a lot of the, the stands, the Caucasus, and the Central Asian states. It seems to be fracturing. Armenia, in particular, is seemingly moving away from Russia's orbit. There was a visit by Nancy Pelosi a few weeks ago, which went down very well indeed. And in fact, Ukrainian flags were flown at the time. Um, and this is uh, it, it. It's very interesting to see what's happening there. And I would. Just be really interested, Alione, if you wouldn't mind jumping in here, just to uh, your view on on what these former Soviet states, their relationship with the centre, and how how much it means to Russia and Putin in particular to to be able to point to friend and and, and other North Korea and Iran, of course, uh, to point to other states to, to say that they want to be part of of this of the CSGO, and in particular this union state. What is this union state that has been proposed? The idea that been around for a while with this link, this union with Russia, Belarus, and uh, and Armenia, and how important do you think it is that, that Mr. Gregorian is is pushing back against it? Thank you, Don. Well, first of all, I'll start by saying that the dynamics in the post-Soviet region have been very interesting to watch in the last year. Obviously, it somewhat slipped attention from the Western audience here because it's clearly not the priority and the main goal is to watch what's happening in Ukraine and follow all the developments and make sure that this war is being fought. But just to quote President Zelensky, who was prophetic in his own way, and he didn't really know about it when he delivered his inaugural speech in the parliament, in the Ukrainian parliament, he said, this moment in time of me being not one of the old Soviet politicians uh, taking charge in Ukraine, you know, the person from the people, the servant of the people still 
continuing that narrative that got him into the office from the beginning, he urged all of the post-Soviet countries to watch him closely. And he even said the phrase, you shall be next, basically. All of these democratic developments that Ukraine has undergone and start, started undergoing since 2004, he was urging all the post-Soviet countries to follow. And some did, of course. Georgia started before. Moldova is still struggling but trying to maintain that pro-European, pro-democracy development route. We've seen some countries kind of holding off and, and balancing and it's been a very difficult time for those countries, like the one in Central Asia, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, for example. Turkmenistan is further away as well as Kyrgyzstan, so it's somewhat easier for them. They have their own interests. They have a strong Chinese support and leaning more towards the East than towards the West. So it's easier for them to perform this balancing act with Russia. But countries like Azerbaijan, Armenia, Belarus, Georgia... They're still kind of on the line between trying to support Ukraine and remember that really, truly brotherly relationship between the countries, the one that, you know, one might remember that we used to have or at least attempted to have with Russia up to the fall of Soviet Union. Many countries didn't really manage to do it properly. And as you've correctly pointed out, the CSTO was created as an analogy to NATO or an alternative for post-Soviet states, which is very far from it, as you rightly noted. But many of those countries are still trying to perform their balance act. And Armenia, especially, it's very difficult for the country because it's now presiding at the CSTO. And uh, I think Russia was counting on Armenia in return for the support that Russia tried to provide, and I'm saying tried to provide to Armenia in their conflict with Azerbaijan. Armenia was meant to provide all the support that Russia needs in the war against Ukraine. Belarus did so inevitably because Lukashenko was forced into giving everything up, giving all of his power, resources, um, basically his army, his territory, his sovereignty as a fact, not just to join this union state, which was initially created as a union between Russia and Belarus, and which could have possibly led, and maybe still will lead, although now with what's happening in Russia, it's really unclear. I think the whole region will face re reforming and restructuring, and um, things will look very differently even in a year's time. But before that, it was designed to have Belarus getting absorbed into Russia effectively to provide all the resources to serve as that land bridge towards the Baltic states. And that's why the Baltic states are most outspoken against Russian aggression, because they know what follows. We've seen the protests in 2020 in Belarus to go back as far as that, when uh, you know their authoritarian leader, Lukashenko, managed to stay in power despite the protests. And in return for that, for all the financial aid that he's been provided with from Russia, all the political support. He now has to serve Russia as, you know, as, as to his feudal. And I think Russia has kind of counted on Armenia to do the same. They did try to, to voice Armenia's side of things in conflict with Azerbaijan, retaking the territories and kind of, they're obviously uh, peacekeepers, quote unquote, in Karabakh, and they will stay there. They were meant to stay there according to the agreement until 2025. Now, I think that date is being postponed until 2027. So they do have their military presence in Karabakh between the two countries in Azerbaijan. And Armenia obviously hoped that Russia will stand firmer and will voice, will lobby for Armenia's position in that conflict stronger. But I think they failed to see that. And this is why they are having some grievances with Russia saying that, well, since you're now providing all the support that we need, we're not going to help you out in your war against Ukraine, be it political, financial, ideological, whatever it is. So truly, I think even one of the countries that could be an ally to Russia in this war, as well as Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, they're all especially healing the weakness, which I think is very reassuring. All these countries are only being so outspoken and bold with Russia because they can feel that they can afford that. So that's a very positive trend. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. It, that, that sort of, the gloss has come off if there, was, if there ever was any, any gloss. And 
like you say, they're, they're sort of slowly moving away. What's the position of Georgia at the moment? That's a, that's obviously invaded by Russia in 2008, still has Russian troops on Georgian soil, but occupies a slightly dif- different political position. Am I, am I right there? I feel like they are, and it's quite sad for me to watch what's happening in Georgia these days because of the revolution in 2004 that we've kind of started and, and created on the streets of Ukraine, it was inspired by the Revolution of Roses in Georgia a year or two years prior to that, if I'm not mistaken. So they were really the first ones to go for democracy and for the Western values. And they were a great example to Ukraine, believe it or not. I know that in today's mentality, Ukraine is kind of like at the forefront of democracy. But for us, it was Georgia that we were looking towards. And we admire the country greatly. And after our second revolution in 2014, when I was already kind of leading it, not so much participating in it. After that revolution, we've invited plenty of Georgian politicians, civil servants, experienced bureaucrats in the best uh, possible meaning of this word to help us with our reforms because they've been so successful with their reforms after the revolution of roses. I fear that The occupation of the country and, you know, I hear official um, language being voiced that Russian troops are only 20 kilometers away from the capital. So we can't really stand up to them and say, get out of Ukraine and be very outspoken. And that's the official statements that I hear on the record, as you would say, speaking to politicians, diplomats from the country. What I hear unofficially and off the record is that effectively oligarchs who made the most of their money in Russia are now ruling the country. And they are, of course, on one hand, trying to perform that, you know, everlasting balancing act that all the countries in the region need to go through. But on the other hand, they did kind of caved um, and and they they gave in on, on those values that were professed in 2003. And of course, what follows that statement is you have to understand that if it wasn't for 2008 and if it, NATO haven't turned their backs on us, we would now be much closer to the West and to the values that we initially professed. But, you know, the West decided to appease Russia. And so what other chance have we got now? It's very sad what's happening with, with their former president, Sarkashvili, who, of course, is a very controversial figure. And I'm not sure what to make of him, but clearly his state of health is not great at the moment. And I feel like the Western audience is trying to speak up to to make the government free him and, and put him in a hospital somewhere in the West. I think even President Zelensky, in one of his nightly addresses, ask the Georgian government to release him or to move him to the hospital because having the opposition leader or one of them in prison is exactly where Ukraine went through in 2013 and 14 and it's definitely not a sign of a democracy. Yeah, there's been some horrific pictures just recently, I think of Sakish Billy in, in, in the prison hospital when his, his health is, is, is markedly deteriorated. I, I mean, you know, I'm no medical expert, but it looks, it looks as if something else is, is happening there. Anyway, um, Aliona, thank you so much. Let's let's go back uh, back to you, if I may. And if you could sort of briefly sort of sketch us from there, entering politics, as you say, leading the revolution in 2014. I mean, that's quite incredible. Well, it's not it's not incredible. It's it is credible, but it's an amazing uh, journey. If you could just talk us through that, please. Uh, well, thank you, Dom. Indeed, it's it's quite fascinating when I stand aside and and watch it my twenties and clearly not your usual 20s for a normal young person to go through. But I think it also shows kind of the sign of the time uh, that Ukraine was going through. And looking back, in the moment, I felt like the wave was just carrying me. So I didn't really have any political ambitions. I didn't aspire to be a president one day. I was never looking up to politicians on TV and thinking, oh, that's going to be me one day and I'm going to change this country or anything like that. It was all a matter of one instance. Maybe now looking back at it and seeing the history of my family and learning more about it. And when we get to the the Zelensky and talking about my great-grandmother, her father, my great great grandfather was a mayor for 18 years in a person Austro-Hungarian empire and then in Romanian kingdom because we're based in the west so we've seen several empires uh, pass us by and, and then my grandmother was a civil servant 
both of my parents were civil servants. So maybe looking back at it, I did have that kind of note for for civil service is just too empty of a word, but to do slightly more than just take care of yourself and to be that have that impact to change things. And I think again, going back to the times, those were quite monumental times in Ukraine. Because one would think it was the nineteenth when things shifted and when we gained our independence in nineteen ninety one and that was the time to establish yourself as politicians and lead the country forward. But I think because the independence came so abruptly almost and unexpectedly to us, uh, really there was no strong public sentiment to, towards breaking the Soviet Union apart. Of course, the, the strive for independence in Ukrainians was always there. We had our first state established in the early uh, 20th century we always had our nationhood. Like if you go back to our literature and culture, and I've listened to the most magnificent podcast that you did over Christmas, the Telegraph uh, recorded, and it was fascinating that you actually got into Ukraine, seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth century history, because it really showcases that, despite what Putin says, that I know that we have learned to disregard it, but just to prove that there are actually facts that Ukraine is a nation existed always that it was just a matter of time to proving our statehood so I'm, I'm going way too too far back into the history but in 2004 coincidentally i i started my education in the chen Yuti national university um, i was a political science student i aspired to go study philosophy but then my parents said, well, that's really not practical and just in an attempt to give me some sort of profession in life to make it easier for me later. They've suggested political science, which also provides some level of theory and, you know, philosophizing on, on where states and come from and how humans unite and the sociology of it, the ideas and all the rest. And that really attracted me. Little did I know that a month later, after I started the education, the revolution would start. Uh, the Orange Revolution, what we call it now, 2004. And that's when we had our first attempt of overthrowing, first of all, the unfair results of the elections, because the elections were rigged, and the authoritarian government, the authoritarian system as a whole, and moved towards democracy. And I was 17 years old back then, a uh, first year student in the university. I was participating in those protests. Interestingly enough, I remember our professor of political science did urge us to go out onto the streets, even if we don't necessarily believe in the protests or the ideas or know nothing of them, just to observe, to learn, to see how parties campaign, to see who speaks and in what way, how they urge masses to move. So that was a very interesting kind of political experiment in education for us, but I did end up getting involved in it deeply than I probably wanted to. And one of the political parties back then uh, called uh, Batkishina, uh, which then turned into a bloc, Yuri Tymoshenko, chaired, as you could have seen or heard, uh, by Yulia Tymoshenko herself, the then future prime minister of Ukraine. So they did kind of recruit me and never let go of me, despite me traveling to the U.S. to do some internships. I volunteered during the U.S. Senate election, then I came back, finished my political science degree. And while I was finishing that and, and doing my master's in political science, and then the second one in public administration, they did ask me to go work for them as a campaign manager, as editor-in-chief of the local party newspaper. And then I became the deputy chair of of the regional parts organization and eventually started working in headquarters. And I think going through those parts of ranks, while at the same time working in, in various public bodies, uh, like my first job was in Ministry of Transport, where I worked as a press officer, and it just took me from there through, through various government bodies of so regional administration, regional council, where I later was elected as a regional MP as well. and. Um, it kind of took me from there. And eventually, when Yulia Tymoshenko, the, the leader of the party, was imprisoned by then President Yanukovych, who we later ousted the country in 2014, it became constant unrest since 2011. It was just uh, protests and traveling 
throughout Ukraine, rallying support, traveling to the EU. If you remember, the, the EU commission stood up for Tymoshenko. The EU court said that it was unlawful. We had prominent people speaking up for her, but generally it was the beginning of those democratic transformations that we haven't finished in 2004. And it went all the way into 2014 when finally uh, then President Yanukovych refused to sign the EU association agreement. And that was the last drop, I think. So even nowadays, it's very interesting to, to kind of see people learn more about Ukraine and unfolding the history, even the modern history of Ukraine. This, this war in February seems like such a shock and surprise to, to the world. Whereas, you know, the, the very least thing to say is that it started in 2014, but realistically, um, it started as a result of overthrowing that pro-Russian authoritarian government, which started even sooner. It was literally the, 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 the cradle of that was the revolution of 2004 that unfortunately was not finished, but everything was kind of brewing on the inside in Ukraine. And I'm glad that, that we took that path and we, you know, we finished it and we're finishing it now. Sure. Uh, you described there that you, you, as you became more involved in politics, you you said very early on you, you did not harbour leadership ambitions, and yet 2014, there you are, the head of the head of the crowds with the microphone in, in your hand, the images images on, on social media. So so when the when the time came, when the call came, you were not reluctant to to take on that role by the by the look of it. Can, can you talk to us about that that transformation? Did you, when did you feel that you? That you had to or that you needed to you wanted to to, to take on that role and, and and what was it like being at the head of that movement it was absolutely fascinating i'll be honest with you it was scary at times um because as you rightly say you could see me on the square with protesters tens of thousands of protesters in my hometown chenyuti and then on my dan in kiev itself where it came to hundred and thousand people at times and you need to speak to those people you need to make sure that they know what they're there for and you need to deliver all the main points of the day what's happened which negotiations happened what the authorities are saying now what the police is doing who they're persecuting why we're still here why in the temperatures of like minus 10 and minus 15 sometimes because the winters in ukraine are not very revolution conducive but still we some somehow always choose to do all of our revolutions in winter which is just <laughs> unthinkable yes but somehow you know there was a theory that my again going back to my professor Kruvlashov in university said that you know it's historically because we're agrarians the the ukrainians we work on land so in winter when there is no work to be done on the land in the fields we just build up this energy that needs to be let out somewhere <laughs> so that's <laughs> what we why we do all of our revolutions and wind. By mindfulness, a revolution of the mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's one way to explain it. When I was going up there, first of all, I felt the sense of responsibility because, as I've said, I worked in the, for example, in the political party, which was 16,000 members back then. I knew so many of them because we had a structure in regions, in districts, and in every single village. I knew so many of those people personally, I knew their life stories. And just being there and telling them, again, why they need to spend their time, leave their families, come freeze in this temperature. Why are we here to begin with? Why are we escalating things with Russia? Trust me, the things that, the narrative that's being discussed now in the world, in the West, we've already gone through that narrative in Ukraine. And, you know, it's very interesting for me, who is part of delivering that message and explaining it within Ukraine to our local citizens why we need to stand up to Russia, why they just won't let us be, why if we leave the elections rigged as they are and let whoever they want the president to be or whichever parties they want to have in the parliament, just let them go with it, why it's simply not going to work. And it's the same now with the world when we, you know, it's funny to see how we need to explain why the world needs to give up Russian gas, why the appeasement doesn't work, why you you know russia only understands strength and its weakness is what provokes them the most we've been through the same arguments in, internally and i felt the responsibility to explain that because i was naturally exposed to 
so many more conversations and doing the strategy and seeing where it's going to all the risks to make sure that everyone is safe. And just in all honesty, I grew up, again, listening to the stories from my great-grandmother who actually raised me because my parents were so young. But when they had me and my brother, they were 17 and 18, that most of our childhood, they still had to study in colleges and universities. And I grew up with my great-grandmother who was telling me the horrific stories of a, her surviving the Second World War, of them having everything taken away from them by the Soviets when they came and onto, in, into the Western Ukraine after Romanian kingdom, have everything was taken away from them. You know, the term kurkuli, the people who are somewhat richer than others, these wealthy villagers who owned land and some animals and windmills. That was my family to begin with. And, and Soviets took everything away from them, sent them to Donbass to dig trenches ahead of the Second World War. And at the end of the day, she, they ended up with famine in 46, 47 in the Western Ukraine after the war. And th they've seen terrible instances of cannibalism, of the most horrific, you know, scenes that one could possibly imagine, probably only comparable to what we're seeing now in our villages and towns and cities in Ukraine. And again, it was Soviets back then, it's Russians now. The history kind of repeats itself. And I think having grown up with that knowledge and no illusion of, yes, we're neighbors, yes, we have to have civilized relationships, but if the country is not ready to be civilized, we need to protect ourselves from it. And I think that's where it, where it stemmed from. Uh, there were obviously many risks involved. You would always get called up at least twice or three times a week to be interrogated by the police. They would accuse you of all sorts of things that you've never done, never heard of, and just see what your reaction is. They would constantly try to you know, plant drugs on you or other things. So it was quite a school of life for me to go through in my 20s, but also quite a remarkable one for sure. Um, yeah, quite it's staggering. Just one final one before we move it into, into the present. In terms of personal risk, so in 2014, I mean, there, there, there was violence. People were shot. There were snipers on the on the roof around Kiev, around Maidan Square. People, protesters were killed. And you you chose to continue to to single yourself out by taking that leadership role. And as I say, being standing up, holding the microphone, being the centre of attention, having those thousands of people look to you for your for your words i mean how did you how did you keep going knowing that that there was a a reasonable chance i wouldn't even know how to put a put a, a stronger comment on it than that but a reasonable chance that, that you you could have this could have cost you your life i think in that moment um, you just don't think about it too much i mean one would say that it's adrenaline that keeps you going probably the same thing that keeps all of our soldiers on the front line going but I would say that it's much more than adrenaline because hormones inevitably eventually dissipate. Whereas the conviction and that sense of commonhood, it, it stays. And I think it's it reminded me of my what my brother told me because we've discussed off, offline and and we mentioned that you mentioned it in your article that my brother is fighting on the front line now. And he, he said the same thing to me when he's returned briefly home in October. He was extremely, extremely angry about it when I spoke to him. The very first conversation I had with him, I said, you're finally home, thank goodness. You can get some rest, we can get some sleep finally, not worrying about you every night. And he said, what are you talking about? We were, you know, so close. We were one week away to retaking Lysychansk and the only oil refinery in the country that we have. We could have uh, solidified our positions. And and what about all my guys? We're all now spread out across the country. And and I just want to get back to them, to, to my team and continue with what we started because we need to finish it. And it's fascinating because when I was there during the revolution, uh, my brother wasn't there because he was still living and working in the U.S. He's only moved back to Ukraine a year before the war started, actually. Now he's he's on the front line, which is just unthinkable. But I was there and I felt the responsibility. First of all, my family was very supportive. They were extremely scared and worried for me. And, but what fascinated me the most is both my mom and my dad at the time said, you know, we're, of course, extremely worried about you. We're praying for you 
but just be where you feel like you need to be because this is greater than all of us. And that sense of togetherness of Ukrainian community that, again, we are seeing now being showcased in the world. I saw that in 2014 internally, domestically, and that feeling of, of community that you have, it just doesn't let you take a step back and, and it, it keeps you going forward despite any risks that you might face because you understand that it's so much bigger than you. And uh, to, just, you know, to go back to reality, because under no way you are not scared or you're not facing any threats, but the very uh, first death, one of the first deaths, the first death on, on Maidan was uh, of the... Uh, sadly, Armenian uh, guy who was quoting Taras Shevchenko, going back to him but during the first days of, of revolution. But the second death was actually a person from my hometown, from my political party, Alexander Shevchenko. And I remember he hearing the news that he just got shot and, and you know, the body, tr trying to, to get the body from under the bullets into a safe place. And, and the first thought since I was one of the leaders of the regional party organization, I needed to deliver the news to the children because uh, he had, they still has a, a daughter and a son. And I was dreading that. And that was probably one of the saddest moments in my life that, of course, prepared me as, as well as our whole nation for more grievances to come. But even despite that, you know, you have some tragic moments, you cry together, you fight together and you just go on. It's, I don't know, it sounds very romantic and almost unrealistic. And probably if I wasn't a part of that and, and in the midst of that, I would kind of think that this is a story from some fiction, but it's not. It's what we're seeing every day today in Ukraine. That's very impressive. Thank you for sharing that, Aliana. So up to up to today, if I may, end of year report, how do you, how would you assess President Zelensky? Um, has done on the diplomatic front in 2022 and what do you think the priorities should be in diplomatic terms for 2023? I think uh, Zelensky has done magnificently. He's heard many criticism, even domestically, believe it or not. We still hold our politicians accountable. He was being criticized for many things before the war started and now we can kind of hear those echoing again and I'm now going to say that maybe all sorts of other political tendencies that are still there, which means that Ukraine is definitely recovering or on its way to recovery despite leading a war. But I would I will stand by the point that he is being the war leader that we could only have hoped to have. And I've seen I've been in Ukrainian politics for what 18 years now. I think both actively involved and for the last five years kind of standing on the side but closely watching and, and talking to many of my friends who are now MPs and deputy ministers and ministers and um, all sorts of civil servants and, and other positions that they hold. Ukraine has changed dramatically and I think we've, we've deserved the war leader that we have in Zelensky. Uh, he's been incredibly brave. I know he's just, you know, he's meant to be a symbol. He's meant to represent the leadership of the country, but he's done it brilliantly. The way he's communicated, I think we got very lucky with the fact that he was a producer before, not just a performer and a comedian. He was also a producer. He knows very well how to craft the message, how to deliver it, how to communicate it in the most meaningful way to some audiences. I would say maybe. Not to go too much into detail of his communication techniques and strategy. There were some uh, things that perhaps could have been done better, but we need to remember that it's still a country of, in, at war and things can st still get quite emotional and you can't always come up with the best way to say or do certain things. So with that discount, I think certainly we wouldn't be able to kind of galvanize all this support internationally that we have. Um, mm -hmm. Diplomatically, it's important to see that Ukraine has finally come, you know, top of the agenda for so many countries. I'm not going to say all of them, but so many of them. And then it managed to stay there because in today's world, when the attention span is so short and the priorities shift so drastically and every country has its own political and economic interests, 
we've managed to surpass so many of those barriers. Some of them are still in place and we're not getting delusional by any of that. But we've surpassed so many of them, especially with, with the elections um, this last year, that we're kind of putting the whole effort to support Ukraine under the risk, including the elections in the UK and, you know, but what seems like endless rotation of prime ministers. We've gone through midterms in the US and trying to build that support there and keep it going, most importantly, despite some of the very interesting claims made by, I guess, far right is what you would call them, even though they, they didn't used to be that even several years ago, but now they are effectively with their statements that they're making. We've seen elections in Italy, we've seen the new government in Germany adjusting to this new reality and trying to fix everything that the previous government has done wrong. France, of course, especially um, presiding in the Council of, of the EU, uh, was an important ally for us to have. And I think Zelensky has managed to build not just good relationships uh, with countries, but he's built friendly relationships with the leaders, which I think is most important because having seen his sincerity and honesty, that's the, just the feeling that I'm getting from, from watching the interactions, from seeing how people speak, from even reading his tweets, which are certainly a new form of diplomacy. And that's also something that I think passed through everyone's attention in the world because so many more demanding things were happening at the same time. But if you see how the diplomacy transformed, not just because of social media age, but of course, duly partly to that, but the way Zelensky communicates, the way they address the UN, uh, the way they call out certain countries, be it in Africa rallying for support in what they call the, the global south, which I think will be strongly on Ukraine's agenda for the new year to just calling out various countries in the former Soviet Union region, thanking them. You could definitely see how the relationship has progressed through those tweets. If you read them carefully, you can actually see what he's talking about. The very interesting interactions have been happening between Ukraine and Israel. And uh, if you go back to tweets of uh, ambassadors and government officials between the two countries, uh, that's that could be a, a topic for another PhD. So I think the most important thing is U Ukraine is now strongly on the agenda in the world. And the most important thing is to keep it there. And I'm not going even to say that, you know, Ukraine fatigue is going to settle in. I think it's impossible by this point. And that's both a good and a bad thing right now for Ukrainian. It's it's not really great. And I would say it's a bad thing because it only means that more horrific things are expected to come. And therefore, the world will inevitably pay attention to Ukraine um, because this war is not over. And I'm sure that Russia is getting ready to regroup, uh, remobilize and you know, relaunch to in, in pursuit of any victories in Ukraine in 2023. So it's going to be a very difficult year. But I think diplomatically, it's going to be challenging in a way that we could see several countries going for elections. Obviously, important countries like the US and the UK will be preparing for the elections in 2024. We can see the presidency, the Swedish uh, presidency in the Council of the EU as well in the new year. And that's only going to solidify the support for Ukraine. I would hope so. Uh, but then uh, countries who have been closest allies to Ukraine, like Poland, Czechia, Finland, and Estonia, I believe they're all going to be going through parliamentary presidential elections. Uh, Turkey, one of the important countries to watch, and, and that's certainly going to be very interesting with their elections coming up in summer. Um, and, you know, there are even some talks coming from Turkey that Erdogan might not be reelected as a president. And there's a, a close run between the two mayors of Istanbul and Ankara. So that's definitely something interesting to watch and see how Turkey, uh, Turkish dynamic will change in uh, regulating, I guess, the role, their role in uh, sorting out the humanitarian convoy, the Black Sea security generally, and their position in the region and their influence on Russia, which I think Turkey remains the only kind of communications, the direct and open communications channel between the West, Ukraine, and Russia. So many things are going to be very interesting to watch in 2023. And I think the main goal will be to keep, 
keep the support going uh, for Ukraine, not just financially. I think that's still ongoing with all the international conferences. I think Zelensky is meant to speak at Davos and have a certain event uh, dedicated to Ukraine. <clears throat> I think he is planning to announce kind of course for 2023 diplomacy wise and and saying what's what's on the agenda because obviously the main thing for us domestically will be to continue winning this war and I'm very careful with that phrasing but I'm I'm going to speak it into reality and and say that yes the the south needs to be recaptured it needs to be held and recaptured Melitopol and Mariupol are to come uh, Bakhmut is obviously, just to quote President Zelensky, still hell on earth. We need to be very careful with attacks in, in Kharkiv region. Uh, Luhansk is still basically untouched and completely destroyed and, and untouched by Ukrainians. And of course, watch out for that offensive in the north that everyone's looking out for. And I hear even for some soldiers on the ground on the northern border of Ukraine, that they are actively getting prepared for that since September. It's not guaranteed, but but they are looking out for it and, and fortifying their positions there, shall we say. Aliana, thank you so much for that. A tour de force around the around European and international politics, looking looking back and, and looking ahead. Um, time's marching on. Just just going to finally mention, so you and I met the other day when um, I, was, I was allowed to Witness the birth of the Zelensky cocktail. You were the co-curator for um, curator. I now I now discover curator means the is the cocktail word for for um, co-designer. Now I mean it was all it's all oh, good fun. And, okay. I didn't know that. Well, you know, our mutual friend um, took me to task over that when I said creator. <laughs> um, um, uh, I mean, all good fun, yeah, and, and what have you. And I, I don't, I don't want to end on a down note at all. But I mean, this is this is you know, partly done to 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 keep it in the public eye and keep keep talking about Ukraine. But also, as you say, so it's named after President Zelensky because it's strong and endurable, and all the rest of it. By God, it is strong. But you know, you mentioned your your, your personal story. Your brother is serving somewhere we think in the north. Your great grandmother, you use her recipe for the samohorn. Um so just just if you want to finish, please, with your thoughts about about what this what the cocktail meant meant to you, your, the resonances with your with your family, and then because I I can't remember if you could just describe, please, for our listeners what it actually tastes like. Uh, well, luckily, I don't know. Luckily, but I normally don't drink spirits either. The most I can drink is maybe some wine and and champagne, but which was a part of that cocktail. I think it was only in there. Uh, created by another curator. I'm going to use that word uh, to sound very educated now. To to add something that I can drink and and like basically, but the idea behind Samo Huan, um, and you so eloquently describe it in your article is indeed it's it's a drink not for the faint-hearted, and Ukraine has proved to be nothing but faint-hearted this year, uh, whether it be it President Zelensky or my brother who is indeed fighting um, right now in Ukraine and all the others, hundreds of thousands of brave men and women in Ukraine who are on the front line and to whom that Samohan is probably nothing compared to what they experience on a daily basis. My great-grandmother indeed uh, came up with that recipe and taught me that recipe while babysitting me, <laughs> um, believe it or not. So that's what she did along with other pastries that she made for me. She also showed me how to do that for some reason, just part of her housekeeping and um, to trying to keep the child entertained and occupied. But she did always mention going back to the stories of her life and surviving the war and the famine, that that's one of the things that she vouches to to prove, to, to provide her with living until the age of 98 now. Um, she's passed away a few years ago, but <clears throat> she did say that that kept, kept her going. It killed typhus, is the name of illness that I'm trying to remember while we were creating the cocktail uh, the very first time. Uh, it helped her with, you know, being not getting frozen in Donbass in the trenches. And I think that's that kind of showcases the resilience of Ukrainian people and um, our willingness to, to keep going and to endure the strongest things possible. And I think. For me, having the opportunity to, first of all, forever ingrain 
uh, the memory of my granny, who was always the symbol of that Ukrainian resilience and endurance for me personally. And now seeing my brother kind of going through almost the same thing and and confirming that in our family and us all supporting him together. And, you know, the only thing I can do here in London, apart from like volunteering, fundraising and, and whatnot, is the informational front, which was is extremely important, and I'm doing my best here and and putting that cocktail in in the Special Forces Club cocktail book forever for there to stay, and um, you know forever putting President Zelensky into the history of prominent people uh, with their most outstanding cocktails in that book, and put that to symbolize Ukraine's resilience and strength. It really means a lot. And I do hope that that cocktail will survive not just years, but maybe even decades and eventually become uh, something that's being taken by the British people on a regular basis. Who knows? And I think it came just in time for the holidays. And I've already got plenty of responses on Twitter that they will definitely be having it on New Year's Eve. So beware, um, English people. Please be careful and uh, drink with caution. It is Ukraine. Well, Aliona, thank you so much for that. I can I can assure you it, it will survive. It's got a longer half-life than polonium-210, for God's sake. But thank you. I really do appreciate that. Amen. And uh, I wish you all the best for the new year. If you want the Zelensky cocktail recipe, you can also find that online in the Telegraph. And if you have a look at my Twitter feed, you'll see you'll see links to that. But as Aliona said, treat treat with uh, with, with caution and uh, make sure you have, you're, you're not doing anything significant the, the next day. Aliona, thank you so much for your time. A happy new year wish you all the best and your and your country and your family all the best for for next year i will see you again uh, see you again soon yeah let, let's meet up over zelensky sometime soon <laughs> definitely thanks aliana thanks everyone <laughs> you may remember that a few weeks ago francis asked you to send us your thoughts as we head into a new year so here are some of our listeners Thank you so much for sticking with us this year for your Ukraine updates. And we'll start with one listener who's stolen my line. Hi, David. Hi, everybody. So I am a half Ukrainian born and living in England. Uh, I've got family in Lviv and previously lived in Moscow. So I've got people I'm still in touch with from, from then. Um, I've been listening to the podcast since, since it begun. And when the second phase of the war started in February this year, my reaction was was similar to most. It was shock, sadness, and an overwhelming sense of anger. The reaction by the vast majority of the world to quickly come to the support and aid of Ukrainians was it was at least reassuring. Um, I'd I'd like to take this voice note to thank you all that work on the podcast personally for your ongoing coverage. I wish I'd never heard any of your voices, but the reality is that the longer this goes on, the less coverage it gets. And, and seeing Ukraine articles fall lower on the online news websites or further into the newspapers is particularly difficult to see. Um, we see the work that Zelensky and, and Ukraine are doing to maintain focus from their partners uh, for funding. And similarly, it, it's on us to maintain public awareness. And that's why it's so important that things like this podcast continue to grow in listeners. So. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll just take a pause there. I hope that was interesting. Hello, my name is Mizuho, and I'm Japanese. I've been listening to Ukraine the latest since the war began. I am Japanese, and I was living in Japan when I started listening to this podcast. I moved to Canada to study, but I am still listening to this podcast. First of all, I appreciate that you all still keep recording this podcast and sharing information about Ukraine. My friend is Ukrainian and still living in Ukraine. And because of martial law, he cannot leave the country. He's very strong and luckily I still can keep in touch with him. But since he's so kind, he does not share about the current situation to not make me worry. Honestly, I'm scared that people in the world stop supporting Ukraine. I know that it is almost the end of the year and still, and I do not want to believe that this is continuing. I feel like I am not able to get much information about Ukraine compared to before, especially from my country. 
Japan. People are getting used to the situation, and it scares me. At the same time, some British channels like this, creating the latest, keep informing us what is happening, and that is so much mean to me. Thank you for listening. Hello, Telegraph team. My name is Vladimir Tereschuk, and I'm listening to you guys from New Jersey, United States of America. Uh, I represent Ukrainian diaspora here in America, and、um, I would like to thank you for your very hard work delivering accurate information about my homeland, where I still have most of my family. Thank you so much. A Telegraph team for the、uh, Ukraine the latest podcast. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas. Hi, this is Michelle in South Africa. I listen to your podcast daily. When I was a student in apartheid South Africa, I would rather pretentiously say that what I wanted most from life was is justice. And perhaps I'm not as pretentious, but I've always been completely drawn to areas around the world where there's. Authoritarian regimes, or people struggling, or people turned into refugees.、Uh, this is also because my family—I am a descendant of refugees from Eastern Europe and all those shifting boundaries. In fact, just as the this current invasion started in February, I happened to be looking at a map of Ukraine and trying to work out where on the Dnieper River my grandfather had come from. So it was quite a bit of a shock that at the moment of looking at that map. Russia was invading this actual area I was looking at, and I was struck. I've been struck by listening to all the stories from the people that, in fact, their experience of the Russian invasions is very alike my family's experience of the Nazi invaders, and how long, even though I had nothing to do with the Second World War, I still have reverberations of that trauma on my family. And I imagine how the people in Ukraine will have a continue to have that trauma for generations to come. And I feel that listening daily to a podcast and finding out as much as I can about、uh, the war is the very least I can do. Dobry den to the Ukraine, the latest team. This is Matthew in Melbourne, Australia. I'm a regular listener. I haven't missed an episode since around the beginning of June. Um, I'm a Ukrainian Australian. I'd like to say thank you for your reporting,、uh, your tremendous interviews, the expertise of your entire team.、I、find your podcast the most insightful、uh, view on what is currently happening in the war, and I'd like to congratulate you for all of your efforts. I spend about three to four hours a day on the topic, and that includes listening to your podcast and others. And learning the language as well as catching up on all of the news that I can. Please keep up the good work, and Slava Ukraini. Ukraine: The Latest is an original podcast from the Telegraph. To stay on top of all your Ukraine news, analysis, and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to the Telegraph. You can get your first thirty days completely free at telegraph.co.uk/audio, or sign up to dispatches. Our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1 p.m. London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces, and we're back to normality tomorrow. So do follow the Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app, and if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk, and we do read every message. We're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Today, Ukraine the latest was produced by Louisa Wells.